This teaching is called Servants of the Most High God. In one of the previous teachings, Kingly Authority of the Joshua Company, Father gave a word in which he said, I will have you seated with me, for I honor those who honor me with their lives. If you've not listened to it yet, please do so on our website, the page called Prophetic Words, and the word is called Ever Watchful. So today we're going to build upon that some more. In Luke 14, Yeshua tells his disciples that if they wish to be great, they should serve just as he came to serve and not to be served. He tells them in Luke 14 verse 10, But when thou art bidden, go and sit down in the lowest room, that when he that bade thee cometh, he may say unto thee, Friend, go up higher, then shalt thou have worship in the presence of them that sit at meat with thee. He tells them to go and sit down in the lowest room. I'm of the opinion that this sitting down in the lowest room is not to be seen as a one-time thing when we will meet him at the banquet. Knowing his dealings with us, this is a disposition he is requiring. A disposition speaks of a fixed place, one that does not fluctuate due to circumstances. At that time, the lowest room would be that of the servants. He is asking them to not only serve, but be servants. In essence, this is what this teaching is about. It's about the disposition of a servant, which is more than washing feet and a cleaning house, which is merely an outward display. Rather, it is a state of being. Many are there who serve, but are not servants at heart. The service is done whilst gritting the teeth. And we know he does not look at the outside, but at the heart. With all things in his kingdom, everything is by degrees. The depths and width of his word is so wide and deep, and what means to us one thing in the past can have a much deeper meaning now. So in this week, he's been speaking to me about this very thing, to sit down in the lowest room, which is humility. The lowest room means a place, but the Strong's explains it also metaphorically as a condition or station held by one in any company or assembly. The lowest would be the servants who were responsible in those times to wash the dust off the guests' feet. Yeshua showed us this example by washing his disciples' feet, saying, As I have done to you, now you do to one another. Note, you do not get to choose when you can go and sit at the table, but rather he says, and when. You do not know when that when comes. However, the point is, your focus is not to be called to the table, but to serve. I hope to convey in this teaching the true disposition of a servant and Yeshua's heart towards his servants. Also to convey that there are depths and degrees of humility which he brings us into. Of course, this is to encourage you, but also to make the cost crystal clear. If it was ultimate for him to leave his father's side to come and serve us, then it will be ultimate for us as well to serve him. In Philippians 2, we see that his very first act in coming down to this earth was humility. In fact, coming down itself is humility. God is humble. So let's read Philippians 2 from verse 5. Paul says, Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore, God also hath highly exalted him, and given him a name which is above every name. Now note, Paul starts off by saying, let this mind be in you, meaning have the same disposition which Yeshua had. 
This humility ultimately led to his death. And we are called upon to have the same humility as he did. Not just the death of the cross, but the absence of any life that comes from the body or soul whilst he was here on earth, which is to walk by the Spirit. The ultimate reward was that the Father highly exalted him, and to us the invitation comes to sit with him at his table when we sit at the lowest room. An ultimate cost for an ultimate reward. And the question remains, how badly do you want it? So I'm hoping to convey the difference between acts of servanthood and that of being a servant. One, you have to constantly die to your own will. The other, you have died to your own will. A good example of this is that the word servant used by Paul and others means bond servant or slave. Slaves, whilst working for their masters, had no choice. Every day they, would, they were told what to do. However, it was the law at that time that they must be set free after seven years. A bond slave is a slave that has died to his own will. He, after being set free, returns to the master willingly serving him. In essence, there are many servants and slaves, but very few bond slaves in Christ. This is transitional. And by his mercy, he guides us into this state of being a bond slave through numerous deaths. Ultimately, this will not be an easy teaching as the flesh hates to die. And whilst we are willing to die to self, there comes a point in his asking where only he can do this in us. Where we end, he begins. The point is that he wants to bring us to our end so that he can begin. If it's going to be, it's not going to be because we did something, but rather because he did something in us. It will offend the flesh and thoughts of this is taking too far or surely God would not require this of us will rage battle against that ultimate cost. There is a divine principle in the kingdom of God, which is that the first shall be last and the last first. This is not only true with the Gentile bride being first to go before the Jewish bride but also those who are the least. This cannot be superficial. It has to be the real thing. In this past week, I had a quick dream. Some of you may know the polka dot lady who has a YouTube channel. As a rule, I do not listen to other prophets because I do not want anything to distort or influence what he wants to show me. It's important for me to stay in my lane. And here is the dream that I had. In this dream, she came to sit on my bed next to me whilst I was sleeping. She cupped my face in her hands and started to prophesy over me. I cannot remember everything she said, but what I can remember is that she said, You will de descend and ascend into heaven. At this, I started crying in my dream, knowing that this is a confirmation to what he already told me, that of being able to see the heavens opened up. I woke up crying, obviously grateful to Father. I was, however, quite puzzled as to why he used her to give me this message. Note, I was also not looking for confirmation, so he had a purpose to bring this up again. She is to me an unlikely person to use, as I do not know her. It was then that the Spirit reminded me of Philip, that came to Nathaniel and told him about Yeshua, the son of Joseph, who comes from Nazareth, the one whom we have been prophesied about. Nathaniel's reaction was, can anything good come from Nazareth? And Nazareth at that time was looked down upon. A further emphasis of our Saviour's humility. The point was Nazareth, the most unlikely place. It was as if the mere fact that Yeshua came from Nazareth disqualified him. It made him unlikely to be the one prophesied about. So you see, he uses the most unlikely people for his purposes, like fishermen, children, tax collectors, women, and lo and behold, donkeys. So having said that, please understand that I share in my teachings his dealings with me not to boast or to tell you the great plans he has for me. I tell you so that you can see the pattern in how he deals with us, so that you can understand his ways and what he is asking of you. Some of you will recognize some of what I speak about and it will serve to encourage you that you are indeed on the right path. Others 
it will bring greater understanding of the cost. It was also Father's intention to remind me of Nathaniel, who received the same prophetic word from Yeshua after he said, Behold, a true Israelite without guile. That's in John 1. Let's read verse 51. And he saith unto me, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Year after, ye shall see heaven open, and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of God, or the Son of Man. I remember a vision I had about two and a half years ago of an open door in the heavens, and I was walking up steps to go through this door. Yeshua came down as I was going up and touched me lightly on the shoulder, saying, I am the way, and I instantly knew that he meant that in the same way he came down was the way he went up, meaning the way up is to go down. In Revelations 3, we read of the message spoken to the church of Philadelphia. We're told that they will have an open door that nobody can shut. This open door speaks of free access as the angels ascend and descend upon the Son of Man. This is a reference to the 144,000 who will follow the Lamb wheresoever he goes during the tribulation. Note, they too are without guile, just like Nathaniel. They are his witnesses, his friends, and they lay their lives down for him. John 15 is a reference to these friends, the 144,000. This is the start of Jacob's trouble of the tribulation or the grape harvest. During the seal period of the tribulation, it will be the wheat harvest gathered in, but during trumpet period, it will be the grape harvest. For more on this, please visit his fair maiden's website, the page called End Time Foundation. In John 12, he tells his disciples that unless a corn of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it will abide alone. But in John 15, he talks about being the vine and then being them being the branches that have to produce fruit. So two different harvests for two different periods of the tribulation. When we hear the words Jacob's trouble, we also connect it with Jacob's struggle, where he wrestled with the angel of God through the night. It was then that the angel, seeing that Jacob will not relent until he blesses him, touched him on his hip. This brings me to my next dream that I had in this past week. Note, this is the same Jacob who received a dream that angels were ascending and descending from a ladder, which we call Jacob's ladder. All this that I have spoken about from the lowest seat of the room to be invited to a higher place at the table from angels descending and ascending points to a principle of the kingdom of God, which is that before we can ascend, we have to first descend. This is not new to us. We understand the basic principle. However, the question is to what degree or extent. So this is the dream that I had. In this dream, I was sleeping and in my sleep, I touched my hip and held my hip joint in my hand. I tried to put it back, but was unsuc unsuccessful. My daughter then told me, the mere fact that you are holding it in your hand tells you that it cannot be placed back. So the interpretation of this short dream is that weakness is a permanent condition he requires of his servants. Jacob was touched on his hip so that from there on he always had a limp. The hip was where they kept the sword and it represents man's strength. God has to touch that area of strength we depend upon so that we never return to it. This strength means the source from which we live. You can understand that it represents numerous things in our lives. The point is, he will work and remove all things you depend upon in order to baptize you in utter weakness. When Jacob was humbled, Declaring himself a deceiver, as this is what the name Jacob means, he was told that he would no longer be Jacob, but be a prince and would be called Israel. The day after this dream about the polka dot lady prophesying over me about descending and ascending into heaven, and the dream about the hip joint held in my hand, I had another experience. I was worshipping the Lord God, and at a certain time of becoming quiet before him, I saw my hands dripping with oil. It 
It was a steady flow and it felt almost like hot oil coming down over my head, down to my fingertips, noticing the oil dripping. It was only later that I realized the significance of all three of these incidences after each other. We read about Jacob's dream in Genesis 28. So let's read that and we're going to start from verse 11. And he lighted upon a certain place and tarried there all night because the sun was set and he took off the stones of that place and put them for his pillows and lay down in that place to sleep. And he dreamed and behold, a ladder set up on the earth and the top of it reached to heaven and behold the angels of God ascending and descending on it and behold the Lord stood above it and said I am the Lord God of Abram thy father and the God of Isaac the land whereon thou liest to thee will I give it and to thy seed and thy seed shall be as the dust of the earth And thou shalt spread abroad to the west and to the east and to the north and to the south. And in thee and in thy seed shall all the families of the earth be blessed. And behold, I am with thee and will keep thee in all places whither thou goest and will bring thee again into this land. For I will not leave thee until I have done that which I have spoken thee of. And Jacob awaked out of his sleep, and he said, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I knew it not. And he was afraid, and said, How dreadful is this place! This is none other but the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. And Jacob rose up early in the morning and took the stone that he had put for his pillows and set it up for a pillar and poured oil upon the top of it. The Lord told me about four years ago that he's making me a pillar and a pillar in this context serves as a memorial to what God has done. However, the oil, just like the oil that I saw coming down over me, poured over the pillar, is to consecrate it as holy. And so he makes us his pillars, consecrating us that we may be a memorial built up in him. And what are pillars made of? Of stone. And essentially stones are dust. So when I read this scripture, verse 14 had a new meaning to me. Jacob is told that his descendants will be as the dust of the earth, which we normally understand to be innumerable. However, the Spirit arrested my attention to understand that this is true concerning their disposition as well. They would be as dust. Now, Jacob refers to the Jews, as in Psalm 102, we read that Israel will be brought to dust, just like Job repented in dust and ashes. It refers to to their ultimate end, their lowest place. When God gives a promise, he then starts to work that promise in us. This is why he says in his word that he will perfect that which concerns us. He prepares the vessel to be able to authentically walk in that promise given and to be able to maintain that promise. And how does he build us up into a pillar? By breaking us down. And this is what he did with Jacob. He first gave the promise. Then he caused him to go through tribulation. In Genesis 28, he receives the promise that he will inherit the land. In Genesis 29, he falls in love with Rachel and receives Leah instead. He has to work for both of these brides. For seven years he works under Laban to get Rachel, receiving Leah, only to work an additional seven years again. And in order to get the cattle, he had to work seven additional years as well. These seven years are a reference to the tribulation. The number seven is the number of God, and it means rest, completion, and ultimately it means covenant. Speaking of slaves, these seven years that the slaves worked are their tribulation. 
after which they could enter into their rest being set free. They no longer have to work. When they return to their master, they return as bond slaves. Now the workers during the tribulation are bond slaves. They come to work by their own choice. Nobody's forcing them. And so we ourselves, in order to receive his promise of rest, have to go through our own tribulation. Not that it will be seven years long, but until we have come into our rest. This means it can take much longer, and I can safely say it will. Our Jacob, Yeshua, toils ardently and with great fervor in our land, which is our heart, so that he may have us completely. He is in travail with us until this promise is birthed in us. It took him many years of toiling and travail for him to fulfill his promise in me to make me a pillar. We are his workmanship. Most have a great desire to be used by God and to have some use or significance in the kingdom of God. Who does not want to see the heavens opened and angels descending and ascending upon the Son of Man? Who has not at times felt left out because they do not receive visions and dreams and hear God speaking to them as others do? Who have not felt that sting of rejection, feeling that you are not chosen? Who has not felt that you are not good enough and probably be Never will be. What we do not realize is that at the heart of this longing, how sincere we may think we are, lies pride. And this pride is selfish spiritual ambition veiled as spiritual ministry because we desire to use him rather than to be used by him. It's a matter of the heart. We would rather be seated at his table than in the lowest room We are even willing to go to the lowest room only if he would raise us up to sit with him, unaware of our selfish ambition to want to be loved, recognized and chosen by God. He does all these things because he chooses so and not because we humble ourselves. What if he asked you to be willing to be seated at the lowest place forever and never be raised up to sit at the table? Would you do it then? What if the price he asked of you had no reward? That to serve him is enough because he is enough. Do not be too quick to answer that. Think of what it means to serve him like that, especially in great suffering. You are nothing. And if I could paint a picture of what that would look like, it would look like Job. In fact, God introduced Job to Satan saying, have you seen my servant Job? So there was another servant God used mightily. He was the very first martyr called Stephen. Let's read about Stephen in Acts 6 and 7. In Acts 6, we're going to start from verse 1. And in those days, when the number of the disciples was multiplied, there arose a murmuring of the Grecians against the Hebrews, because their widows were neglected in the daily ministration. Then the twelve called the multitude of the disciples unto them, and said, It's not reason that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. So before I go on, just listen to the credentials. Verse 3. Wherefore, brethren, look ye out among you seven, that's the number seven, seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business to serve tables. But we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of of the word. And the saying pleased the whole multitude, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Ghost, and Philip, and Prochorus, and Nicanor, and Timon, and Permanus, and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch, whom they set before the apostles, and when they had prayed, they laid their hands on them. 
And the word of God increased and the number of the disciples multiplied in Jerusalem greatly. And a great company of the priests were obedient to the faith. And Stephen, full of faith and power, did great wonders and miracles among the people. The name Stephen comes from the Strong's number G4735 and it means crowned, a mark of royalty or exalted rank, a garland or wreath for those victorious, given as a prize to the genuine servants of God and it means honour. In other words, those who are seen as his royalty are those servants willing to serve the tables rather than to sit at them. Each name mentioned has a very strong meaning, which you can look up in your own time. My question is, are you living up to your name? And what that means is, have you seen all his dealings with you to make you walk authentically, in authenticity, to live up to the name he has predestined for you? Are you a Philip or a Prochorus, a Nicanor or a Timon? My name is Petra, which comes from Peter, meaning little stone or pebble, but he also told me I am his Anna. He makes us into that which we are called, and so to call us by our name is to cause us to walk in the reality of that name. To know his name is more than the letters we put together and often fight over. To know his name is to know him And he says in Psalm 91 verse 14, Because he has set his love upon me, therefore will I deliver him. I will set him on high, because he hath known my name. Now what happened to Stephen, this lowly servant who waited on tables? What was his greatest moment of glory? We know very little about Stephen. The same can be said about Nathaniel. It's almost as if the Lord keeps them hidden And he does so to protect them because these guileless ones are the number one target of the enemy. Because by their virtue and guilelessness, they express the very innocence and face of God being unveiled. We should say no longer veiled by selfish ambition, guile and seeking the applause and approval of man. They are the visible expression of the invisible God in the flesh. And this does not happen overnight. So scripture further states that there were people coming against Stephen. However, in verse 8 of Luke 6, verse 8 and 10, let's read that. And Stephen, full of faith and power, did great wonders and miracles among the people. Verse 10. And they were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spake. So obviously God was doing the speaking and the wonders. In Acts 7, Stephen starts to upbraid them and by the Spirit start to testify how their fathers have always spoken against the true prophets from the very beginning and that they are ultimately guilty of the same. But the part that really got them was that this mere servant saw the heavens opened up and seeing Christ at the right hand of the Father just caused them to blow their lid. Let's read about that in Acts 7 from verse 51. Ye stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, ye do always resist the Holy Ghost, as your fathers did, so do ye. Which of the prophets have not your fathers persecuted? And they have slain them which have showed before of the coming of the just one, of whom ye have been now the betrayers and murderers who have received the law by the disposition of angels and have not kept it. When they heard these things, they were cut to the heart, and they gnashed on him with their teeth. But he, being full of the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God and said, Behold, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. Then they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and ran upon him with one accord and cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at a young man's feet 
whose name was Saul. And they stoned Stephen, calling upon God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And he kneeled down and cried with a loud voice, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. Note that Stephen was not concerned about his own welfare, but his very last prayer was to forgive those who stoned him, asking Father to forgive them. Stephen was full of the glory of the Lord and looked steadfastly into heaven. They could not harm him as Stephen at that very point knew exactly what they would do to him. He was at his Lord's disposal to do with him as he pleases, even to the point that when they stoned him, like Christ, he begged God to forgive them. And like Christ, he asked his spirit to be received. So I have a strong feeling we will be seeing Stephen at his table. As by now happenstance, that the witnesses' clothes were laid at the feet of Saul. Little did Saul know that the witnesses' clothes at his feet served as an indictment of his guilt of those very things Stephen spoke about, a murderer of God's prophets. And little did he know that he would pick up Stephen's mantle of martyrdom and wear it himself. Not long after that, Saul became Paul on the road of Damascus where he was blind for three days. The Pharisaic scales had to fall off his eyes first before he could see, not with his own eyes, but through God's eyes. And something had to die in Saul to become the Paul who would see heavenly things and would suffer great things for the kingdom of God, wearing Stephen's mantle in the spirit. This great man often introduced himself as the bond slave of God. As I was preparing this devotional, the Holy Spirit kept on reminding me of a dream I had approximately eight years ago. Some of you may have heard this dream, but Father wanted to show a new perspective. It's a dream of an eagle. I dreamt that I was standing in my bedroom, and down the hallway I saw Yeshua coming towards me. He was wearing a light brown garment. In the corner of the ceiling I saw a very tiny black spider. I grabbed a broom, desperately trying to kill it, but it got away. The next moment, I was standing next to Yeshua and he had a baby eagle in his hand. It was so small that it could lay in the cradle of his hand. However, this baby eagle was sick. It barely had any feathers, unable to keep its neck up and was very pathetic looking. Now one could imagine how much he must have pitied this eaglet. However, the next moment, he broke its neck and killed it. Till today, I can still clearly hear the breaking of its neck as it ran through my body. Yellow bile came out of its mouth, and to our right was a glass showcase. Inside the showcase was an American bald eagle watching us. In fact, this eagle had an exaggerated eye, almost the size of a small saucer. Even though it was looking ahead, the eye was facing us. And that was the end of the dream. My interpretation at the time was that the baby eaglet represents my prophetic ministry and that anything I did out of my own represents this pathetic looking eagle. It had to die and this was not wrong. However, Father wanted me to focus on the eyes. Firstly, Yeshua dressed in light brown clothing represents humility. The very small spider represents guile that was removed once the eaglet was killed in the form of bile. As much as I wanted to kill the spider, I could not. Only he could do it, and the way to kill it was to kill the eaglet. Before any resurrection, there has to be a death. I was that eaglet. Unless he killed all in me, I would never be able to see as he needed me to see, represented by the eagle in the showcase. And the reason for the showcase is to say that it will be on display. However, the eagle was focused on one thing. He was focused not on the surroundings, but on Christ. An exaggerated eye speaking of a singular focus, not on heavenly things, but Christ himself. 
and seeing him as he truly is can only be done when he has removed all guile from us. When I thought about this dream again and just how he has done this in me, I started to cry in gratitude for such a mercy of his dealings with me through the years. I picked up a tissue and from the tissue a tiny black spider came down. That same morning I went outside to go play with my dogs and on the ground a baby bird has fallen from its nest. And this morning I saw a YouTube short of a beautiful American bald eagle named Spirit. Everything in the exact order of my dream. First the spider, then the baby bird, then the American bald eagle. There was no hope for this baby bird. I took a photo of this bird knowing that this was Father's way to confirm to me that I needed to speak to you about this dream. This is the photo of this little bird. This in turn reminded me of when I moved into our present house about eight years ago and found a dove as this one laying on the grass. I could not find the nest and I, as I picked it up I clearly heard Father saying, are you willing for me to make you as this bird, as good as dead? And my answer was no quick yes. And from then on, this is exactly what he did in me. He stripped me of everything as I went through my own tribulation. And I can truly say that in the spirit I looked as this baby bird. True seeing comes to those who are poor in spirit, those who have allowed him to make them barren, destitute and devoid of any strength, just as he was on the cross, which is to say completely and utterly dependent upon him. It is then when you see and seek no longer the heavenly things, but like the American bald eagle, you see only him. You start to see as he sees. You see him in all things. Your focus is not the heavenlies. Your focus is him. You do not seek the great things of dreams and visions, prophetic words or even miracles. You see and seek only him. Even if he never gives you any of these things and you remain his bond slave forever, he is enough. He brings you into a sweet contentment filled with his peace. Your soul is satisfied. Paul in 2 Corinthians 12 speaks of this person whom we know, whilst we understand it to be, whom he knew, whilst we understand it to be Paul himself, who was caught up in the heavens and then also into paradise. He told them that he wished not to boast about these things. Imagine if we had seen what he did, how quickly we would start a YouTube channel or tell all about it. Not so with Paul. Here was a man, utterly devastated by God and a bond slave to the core. And this is what he says. Let's read that in 2 Corinthians 12 verse 9 and 10. And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Let's be honest. Of what would you have boasted? What had to transpire in Paul to come to this point where he could say that he actually takes pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions and in distresses? Yes, be grateful for what your hardship teaches you, but take pleasure in them? Was he a masochist? Was he a sucker for pain? Or did something transcendent happen to this man equal to that of Stephen, where pain became glory, where suffering became joy? This is a mystery given to those appointed to suffer great things for the kingdom of God. Because their suffering and death 
is the very express image of the cross, the greater things he has promised all over this world in the time to come. You fear only that which you can lose or that which can cause you to lose. You know, So if you have nothing and you are nothing, you do not fear. And the absence of that fear is not just faith, but faith that worketh through love. It is the suffering love of God expressed as the manifestation of the sons and daughters of God to a world groaning in anticipation and in despair. In Romans 8, Paul, who speaks from experience, having transcended to this place, says from verse 35, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword. As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long, we are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. As much as we would like to take this as God would never leave us, true as it is, what it actually speaks of is those who walk by the Spirit, which is not only the way they live, but who they are, a disposition wrought in them through all his dealings with them. They cannot be moved, for they are in him. Everything is seen as coming from him. These souls are the ones that are content in all things. They embrace suffering as a long-lost child. I've only recently entered into this disposition where I do not only accept suffering, but embrace it with joy. When we start off with our walk in Him through sanctification, we start with an understanding that these sufferings are needed to mold us and prepare us. We then move on to actively endure it and become increasingly grateful, the latter becoming a disposition as we mature. The soul seeks small things to comfort comfort it, to give itself rest in the storm. But then as we die to all things, he brings us to rejoicing in hardship, even preferring it, just like Paul. The soul embraces and loves its suffering as the most precious gift. For whether it finds itself in the greatest storm or on the glassy sea, its inner peace is never disturbed by that which surrounds it. Much like in the greatest storm at sea, the roaring and crashing waves with the howling wind, in the depth of the soul there is only undisturbed peace. It's equally content in suffering and joy. In fact, knowing that his suffering love was the full expression of the love of the Father, the soul chooses suffering over joy, even though the one not greater than the other. In the beginning of our walk, we yearn for the release of suffering. We obey and actively pursue him for him to release us. These prayers do not go unnoticed and are answered at times. But when the soul enters into a desire for holiness, these sufferings are the gifts he gives to purify the soul until it learns to continually humble itself under his heavy hand. But the state of perfection is that of resignation to never lose its grip of the hand of suffering, even clinging to it, which is his in which he guides her. The soul gladly follows him wheresoever he goes and carries its cross daily. This is why Paul could say in Philippians 4 verse 11 to 13, Not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. I know both how to be abased and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in 
all things I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. Paul was speaking from a transcendent place that exceeded that of gritting our teeth and hoping we make it. He was speaking from the perfect rest of God where he no longer lived but have been crucified with Christ. I ask Father, Father, to humble ourselves is no new thing for us. What is it that you want to say to your children through this teaching? And this is what he said to me. He told me this on the 3rd of November 2023. Tell them I love them. That it's not my desire to harm them. I love them and only desire to do them good. I've chosen them, not only to use them for my purposes, but to be one with me. That they may know my love for them. This suffering they are enduring is the expression of my love to all those who desire to be one with me. Those willing to go all the way up the mountain of transfiguration will have to endure the harshness of that mountain, but I will walk with them and all the way up and will not leave their side. Their suffering is the expression of my love because to be one with me, all defilement, all vain ambition, all guile and selfish motives have to be removed. Not to only perfect them for what is to come, but most importantly, to be one with me. This I prayed, Father, that they may be one with me. The proof of my love for them is their suffering. Suddenly, I understood that the suffering we endure, we often only see as that which is needed to prepare us for what is coming. However, his main focus is our union with him. Just as a husband and wife long for nothing to separate them, so does he. He longs to be completely united with us as his body. For those who are in Christ are one spirit with him. And just as he was willing to leave his father in heaven to come to earth to cleave to us, so he longs for his bride to leave the earthly things and cleave to her heavenly husband. And with great patience in the furnace of our afflictions, he as our high priest and heavenly bridegroom, afflicted by our pain and suffering, but rejoicing in the outcome of complete union with him. It was Miguel Molano, a 1600th century monk, that said, Keep constant, O blessed soul, keep constant. For it will not be as thou imaginest, nor art thou at any time nearer to God, than in such cases of desertion. For although the sun is hid in the clouds, yet it changes not its place, nor a jot the more loses its brightness. The Lord permits this painful desertion in the soul to purge and polish thee, to cleanse thee and disrobe thee of thyself, and that thou mayest in this manner be all his and give thyself wholly up to him, as his infinite bounty is entirely given to thee, that thou mayest be his delight, for although thou dost groan and lament and weep, yet he is joyful and glad in the most secret and hidden place of the soul. When we look at everything that has been said It appears that there is nothing left but just to die a slow death and hope that somehow this has meaning and purpose and that hopefully your life gives him glory. But that's not life. That's dying. And he said, I've come to give you life and that you may have it in abundance. How many of us can say, I have that life in abundance? Not the things that constitute life like family, home and being able to live a generally carefree life, but that life which he spoke of, which is resurrection life. It is not that he intends only to resurrect us at the last day, but that even now he desires that we may have that abundant life to be resurrected now. Is Lazarus not a prime example of this? 
is the girl he raised from a deathbed, not another example. That he has always intended that we should live from this abundant life that he was living from, which is his father, the very source of life. In John 6, he says that we can have no part in him unless we eat his flesh and drink his blood. To eat his flesh is to share in his suffering. To drink his blood is to be redeemed. When he said that he can do nothing, being the son of man, just as we are, but that he lived from every word his father said and that he only did what he saw his father do, he meant that within himself there was no life except which the Father was in him. He said that he lived by the Father and so we should live from him in John 6. But this abundant life does not come by the means we like. It comes through death and it has to be a total death. As Martha told Yeshua at Lazarus' grave, But Lord, he stinketh. So the very smell of death must come from you to the point where those who look upon you see only death and says, But Lord, he, she, stinketh. It is said that the saddest word spoken is also the shortest verse found in the very same chapter of John 11. Jesus wept. They thought that he was crying over Lazarus, having forgotten that he has just thanked his father for always hearing and answering his prayer. Why would he be sad over Lazarus? He wept because of their unbelief. He wept because they did not truly believe that he is the resurrection and the life now. Yes, Martha said, I know if you were here that you would have been able to heal Lazarus and that you are the resurrection and the life and that you will raise us up at the last day. However, he was weeping because they did not believe that he could resurrect them now. They were more dead in their unbelief than what Lazarus was in his body. The reality is, is that there are some people out there wondering whether God is really requiring such an utter death. They ascribe to the cross, but not a bloody one. They prefer to make it small enough to the point of hanging it on a silver chain around their neck. Some even like it to be big enough to ensure that others see that they are Christians. But even though that cross hangs around their neck, they never ever in their life actually get on that cross. They ascribe to the ideology, but do not live it. For some, they are still hanging on their cross and have not been buried in the ground as the corn of wheat who is to fall into the ground and die. You wonder whether it is really worth it and find yourself grabbing unto small tokens of joy or pleasures, having to let it go eventually until you never pick them up again. Some people have been walking this sanctification journey for so long and all you have seen is death. You have died to your family, your friends, material things, and even spiritual things. And when you look around you, all you see is death. You've lost all joy, but are willing to go on because you dearly love him. His promise is that those who follow him must be willing to lose their lives. And when they do, they will gain their life back again. But those who cling to their life will lose it. You have yet to see that life in abundance, the resurrection life he has promised. Your marriage is dead, your friends have moved on, and there is nothing in life that gives you joy anymore. In fact, in the spirit, you look like that little bird I picked up. If he does not raise you up, nobody can. And yet, you've been in this grave for years, and you have still not heard that voice calling you out of your grave. And you wonder, is it really worth it? Without knowing it, you've become like Martha. You believe he is the resurrection and the life, but just not now. Maybe at the last day, but not now. And Jesus weeps. Martha's name means mistress or woman of rebellion. The same was said of the Israelites in the wilderness who hardened their hearts through unbelief. They murmured. They stopped believing that the God who took them out of Egypt through a great miracle would do it now and that he did not care anymore. Apparently, living from manna, 
and fowls was the only two things on the menu, and their stomachs growled aloud what their mouths would not dare to say, until they could no longer keep quiet, and in their misery they started to long for the flesh pots of Egypt. Why did he save us, only to cause us to die? And they grew bitter. It started slow, but later their mouths spoke out of the abundance of their heart, and to them was given not living waters of life, but bitter water in the wilderness. They could not enter into the promised land because of the hardness of their hearts, which was their unbelief. How many of you secretly feel, why did you save me only to cause me to die in the wilderness? You cannot wait for the rapture because ultimately it would be a grand escape out of your misery. I understand this because I too used to be a Martha. It's no different from Martha. Believing for then, but not now. And he weeps. I often say to him, the life that I have in me is the life you are in me. I could not say that before. Simply put, I have no life in me anymore, just as he had no life in him except what the Father was in him. Of which Paul beautifully says in uh, Galatians 2 verse 20. He says, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Paul was living the resurrection life, that life of abundance. It was not in the absence of pain and suffering. In fact, I know of no one who has suffered as much as Paul did. This is why in Acts 16, we can read of Paul and Silas having been flogged and cast into a dungeon, feet in stocks, singing praises to God with all their heart to the point where the captives were set free, of which they were not. Yeshua said, Father, a body thou hast prepared for me to do thy will. I delight to do thy will. And when he descended from heaven in the form of flesh and humbled himself to the point of death, in obedience to the Father, he was given a body to be the visible expression and image of the invisible God. And having given his body, he received a new one. We are his body. And as his body, he desires to use our hands, our feet, mouth and ears to be the visible expression and image of his love and life. This body has to be one with him. It cannot be divided and for that union, that resurrection life, there has to be a total death. For there can be no resurrection without a complete death. He wants to be that life in your body so that you too may authentically say, I have been crucified with Christ and I live yet not I but Christ in me. You no longer speak, you no longer hear and act from out of that very life that has always been your source, which is your soul and body, but you live by the life of God in you. You've been reduced to dust and no longer have any life in you except the life he is in you. He told his disciples, just as my father sent me, so I send you. How did the father send him? in the form of a body, an earthen vessel, to be the express image of the invisible God, to make manifest his love and all he is to humanity so that all who call upon his name may be saved. He had to take the seat in the lowest room. He who was seated at the right hand of the Father in the heavens had to take the seat in the lowest room on earth. The right hand means strength, and that strength he had to let go and become weak, even in the form of a helpless child. Once again, he clothes himself with humanity, that is to say with our body, that he may through us in our weakness continue the work the Father has given him. At some point, after all this dying, he turns to you and say, Now that you have died to all things and in all things, let me live my life through you. It's time to live, but let me live through you, because what I give to you is me. I am your reward. 
I am the resurrection and the life. Why does he need our bodies? Was what he did on the cross not enough? Should the sacrifice he paid not be enough? Yes, he is enough. However, he told his disciples that they would do greater works than him. What could be greater than raising the dead? The greater work is not in quality, but in quantity. They would be sent out all over the world, and because of their willingness being his opportunity, many through the ages have been saved from eternal damnation, for there is no greater miracle than a soul saved. As long as they are lost souls, they are wanted souls, and he wants them. He came to seek and save the lost. We cannot save them. Only he can. And for that he needs a body given wholly over unto him. He needs a body through whom he can do it. Major Ian Thomas said, A Christian is somebody living in somebody. He told Philip, When you see me, you have seen the Father. He told John the Baptist's disciples that if he did not believe that he is the one sent by God, that he should at least believe the works he has done. He wants us to authentically say, when you see me, you see the Son. Why? Because the Son is the full expression of the Father. Our humanity for his divinity and his divinity in our humanity. God incarnate. In man. What a mystery, what a glory, and what an unfathomable privilege. What he has prepared for us will eclipse what he did for those who waited in the upper room, those chosen to be his servants. What a great harvest it will bring in, and oh, how we will cry out, Yes, my God, it was worth it. All the dying was worth it. Even as he must have said to his father, it was worth it, my father. In Hebrews 12, from verse 2 and 3, we read, Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. He's not seeking imitators. He's seeking the real thing. That is to say, he is seeking those who just like him is willing to become nothing so that he can be everything. He's seeking those who will become dust so that his life can be made manifest in them. I leave you with a word he gave me, which I made a video of on my previous channel, The Spirit of Wisdom and Revelation, that speaks to what he as in store for those who are willing, just like he was, to endure the cross and despise the shame for the joy set before them. I received this word on the 27th of February 2023, and when I read it again, I was astounded how much this word touches on the very things we've discussed in this teaching. So I pray you see this too, and that you will come back to this teaching and word, for his word endures forever. This word is called from dust to glory. I, the Lord, dwell with the lowly, those who seek not honor nor glory, but choose the path of humility, those who seek not the applause of man nor the praise of the crowds, those who seek me in the lowly places of their inner sanctuary, who are contrite and broken and know that they are dust. For surely when they have come to this place, they cannot raise themselves. They can only see my feet. But I will raise them up in my appointed time to be kings and priests who have walked on the road I have traveled. They have followed me when I called and were willing to go into the depths of depravity and poverty of spirit. For blessed are the poor in spirit. Yes, blessed indeed as I will raise them up from dust to glory. But who can ascend into my holy hill and stand before me in my presence? Only those who have traveled to the depths of darkness where they have seen and known the depravity of their own heart. 
those who were willing to look and see and be known as I even know them. For unto them is given to know my heart and to come into my secret counsel. They see only me and therefore they are not lured into the temptations of this world. They look neither to the left nor the right, but only see me. Therefore, they will not follow another, for they truly know my voice. I will teach them to walk through the valley of the shadow of death, as there is no darkness in them. A light unto many to lead to me. Many will follow them simply because they follow me, and they will guide many of my lost sheep into the shelter of my arms. It is them I anoint, and their cup will surely run over, for they were willing to drink the cup of poverty of spirit. Therefore, I will not only restore, but give in abundance to those who walk in lowliness of mind, those who seek only me. They will come up the mountain and there be fed in my presence and my glory forevermore. Amen.